This morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 5, looking at verses 17 through 20. And we are going to talk about the law fulfilled. The law fulfilled. How can a man or a woman, how can a man or a woman become truly righteous? Think about that for a second. Don't just put it in and then let it go out. Think about this. How can you become righteous before God? What can you do so that God accepts you? So that God will bless you? Is there anything that you can do that, that, that will bring God's blessings and love and eternal security in your life by your own work and your own strength? When you really think about that in your own life, you realize there's nothing I can do. That I am a sinner. And if I break one law, I've broken the whole law of God. You know, we lift man up too much, don't we? We really do. We lift men up too much. Uh, we're not to serve man. We are to serve God. Uh, you probably have been hearing uh, the news on the Duggars family. Tender Loving Care, have anybody heard that family? Uh, they have a, a show on, on TLC, and it is a show about their huge 19 kids, their, their faith in Christ and so forth, and, and their moral standards that they have. I mean, they have been really lifted up quite a bit. And then all of a sudden, boom, someone finds out that one of the children uh, at a teenage state, and I'm not going to even go that route but but attempted to to touch the sisters and and some other girls uh, never did but attempted to uh, came in the middle of the night in, in the room and they never even knew anything and boom this thing just exploded like an atomic bomb uh, i saw uh, one little clip where the gay and lesbian rights were screaming and yelling saying how dare they how, how dare they Talk to us about moral values when they're immoral. Now, I understand that view from the world. I can get what they're saying because they're trying to find an excuse to justify their lifestyle. But you can't compare those two because it is a lifestyle that is practiced, that is wrong and sinful. It's an abomination before the eyes of God. And what this young man did is nothing in comparison to what they are doing Okay, so understand that. I'm not agreeing with them. But they're using it as ammunition. See, when we lift up men that high, and we put a TV program, and we're saying that we're good moral people, and we live by very high standards, and we're trying to be an example to the world, you know, we're lifting men up. What they should have done was lifted Christ up. That we're sinners. I mean, that should have been the whole uh, theme of the show is that we're sinners saved by grace and we have this relationship with Christ that that we can maintain on grace because we fall short in so many areas but they were lifted up so high that a lot of people what were disappointed in the whole situation stop lifting up men stop looking to men look to Jesus Christ who fulfilled the law men cannot fulfill the law men will fail you your families will fail you. Your children will fail you. Your fathers will fail you. Your mothers will fail you. So be patient and loving and caring towards them because they're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Let me read the text this morning, 17 through 19, and, and we'll continue on in understanding the law. Do not think that I come to destroy the law, Jesus said, to the, or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, so be called, shall be called least in the kingdom of God or heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The theme this morning is the law fulfilled. Christ came to fulfill the law. Well, what does that mean to fulfill the law? Well, we have to understand what the law is before we, we understand what it means to fulfill the law. Because I'm sure like 
you, you're like me where this is kind of, okay, I don't understand that law. I know what the law is, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. You know, love God and don't take His name in vain and keep holy the Sabbath. And, and those are all pertaining to God. And then you have the ones pertaining to man. You know, don't covet, don't steal, don't lie, and, and so forth. That, that, is that the law that you're talking about? How did Christ fulfill that law then? What are you talking about? We come to the next section here uh, after last week's message on us being a light and shining to the world, our responsibility to preach the gospel. Every one of us should be preaching the gospel in one way or another. Not that you're an evangelist, but you should be sharing your faith. You should be inviting people to church. That is our responsibility, to get the gospel out there. And now Jesus after laying that foundation, he goes on to explain how he came to fulfill the Messianic law. Okay, that is the first five books of the Old Testament. That is where we have the law. So he's talking to his disciples about their relationship to the law. And so we, as believers, have a relationship to the law. The law of God. Many of us think we're not under the law. Because I've heard that phrase quite often. Well, don't put me under the law. I'm not under the law. You're being legalistic. Oh, you're putting us under some rule and regulation. You know? and, and so they use it as an excuse not to live for Christ. And that's what it is, is an excuse. Now, I'm not talking about using the law to gain salvation or a better standing with the Lord. That's another subject. And so we'll divide that for you. So what was the Jewish law that Jesus was talking about here? In the Old Testament... A unique law code was established by direct revelation from God to direct His people in their worship, in their relationship to Him, but also in their social relationships with one another. The law came from God, not from men. So the law that we have in the first five books of the Old Testament are instructions from the Lord to his people so that they could understand what it meant to have a right relationship with him and a right relationship with one another if you read the old testament from genesis to deuteronomy you will find those for five books are a lot of instruction from the priesthood in leviticus uh, to the worship services to their relationship with god and then ultimately when when moses went up to mount sinai and god literally with his own finger wrote down the ten commandments and gave him the Ten Commandments. The Old Testament has a variety of terms, okay? So when we say law, we can also mean this. We can mean Torah. The Torah are the first five books of the Old Testament. That's what the Jews called those books. The word Torah means law. That's all, law. But it can also mean instruction. I, I like that word. It's a little bit softer than law, right? It's not, well, let me give you some instruction. And I think that's what God was saying. Let me instruct you how you have a right relationship with me, how you should have a right relationship with one another. It's also been uh, used as teaching, statutes, you've heard these words, decrees, judgments, legal decisions, even the word. The word is instruction. It's, it's the law. It's a command. These are words that are used as terms for pertaining to the law. And so we don't necessarily have to use the word law. We can use instruction. And again, the first five books are the Torah given to the Jews uh, by God himself. In the New Testament, even they appear as much as uh, the history of law in the New Testament. And you'll see Jesus quite often quoting the Torah in the Old Testament quite often and applying it to the New Testament. Now let's turn to Exodus really quick, chapter 20. And let's look at the law that we know of, and we probably know it more because of the Ten Commandments, the movie, than reading them themselves. But Exodus chapter 20 gives us the Ten Commandments. As relating to God and relating to man. And in verse 1 it says, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves any craven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, 
your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children's children to the third, fourth generation, to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandment. You shall not take my name or the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor your men's manservants, nor your maidservants, nor your cattle, nor your strangers who is within your gates. For in the sixth day the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Those are the commandments relating to God. And the people of Israel were to keep them. We are also to keep them under the fulfilled law of God. Honor your father, in verse 12, and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. This is one of the commandments that is being broken more today because it's a sign of the end. Because in the last days, children will be disobedient to their parents. And so this is actually prophetic here this commandment speaking that in the last days children will not be obedient to their parents we've lost that respect for parents and that honoring of parents Um, that's not based upon your parents being uh, perfect it's based upon them being your parents (laughs) that's it and they deserve and demand honor and respect at all times You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your ox, nor the donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor. So you see how they relate to man? These were the commandments that the Jewish people were to keep. They weren't to be in their little houses looking over their neighbor's yard and coveting their things or their wives. They weren't to go over and steal. They weren't to do these things. Now, what happened is with the Ten Commandments is they began to think that if they fulfilled them, that they had this right standing before God, that they had eternal security because of their obedience to the law. And that's where Jesus comes in. You'll notice that in these Ten Commandments, there are no human penalties that are specified for breaking them. And the last commandment about coveting, I mean, how could you even enforce that in a court of law? How how can you show that someone is coveting? You know, that's something that God has to do. These commandments are not man-made. These commandments are not some uh, justice system that got together and said, hey, let's create some rules and laws to maintain order in this community. No, these commandments are from God, and God reads the heart behind the commandments. Get that. God sees the heart behind the commandments. He sees your heart. If you are keeping the Sabbath, if you are loving God, if you are stealing or even desire to steal. This shows that the commandment should not be classed as a civil or criminal law, but is a statement of basic principles. I I love that because they're principles to live by. And when I approach the Old Testament, I always approach it uh, with the understanding that I'm learning principles. You see, to love God, that can be a commandment. God said, if you don't love me, then I will destroy you. I will judge you one day. Or it can be a principle. A principle to love God so that you have this intimate relationship with the creator of the whole universe. That's a different view of that law. I like that. It's a principle to live by. That I can have this close, intimate relationship with God where I sense Him, feel Him, uh, know His direction and leading and guiding because He has filled me with the Holy Spirit and I have this intimacy with Him just like I do with my wife. You get to know that individual. You're creating a relationship with that person. Um, Roz was walking by earlier this, this morning. I said, hey, Roz, can I talk to you? And she goes, shorten the music, right? And I go, wow, okay. She goes, see, because we're already in that relationship. She knows that, that when I'm stop her before worship and I'm going to talk to her, it's usually that. You know? So that's how you get to know someone because you spend time with them. You're fellowshipping with them. You're a part of the body of Christ. 
So the same with the Sabbath, so same with the honoring and so forth. It's a principle. You honor your parents. You respect your parents. You don't talk back to your parents. That is all sin in the eyes of the Lord. You don't accuse your parents. Boy, you don't accuse your parents. If anything, you protect and, and, and you um, always be positive in your speech about your parents. The Jews were good at this, though. They loved to turn these laws into, into little pieces of paper where they could read them and follow them. The Jews discovered that there were 613 commandments in the Torah. 613. And they literally had to follow 613 laws. Can you imagine that? There's a few laws that we have, and, and we have a struggle following it, like a stop sign. <laughs> 248 of those laws are positive laws. They're good laws. And another 365 are negative laws. So what is the purpose of the law? Okay, so we know we, we have this law in the Old Testament. It's not a civil criminal law that was given by men. This is a law that came from God. And these laws they needed to follow in the Old Testament. We don't need to follow them in the New Testament today as they did in the Old, expecting eternal security and expecting a good standing with God. No, now today we look at them as principles in our lives that we follow because we have this love for the Lord. We have this respect, this honor for God. And so we keep them out of principles knowing that they're good to keep. They're good to keep. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say you're in a little community and you're walking by some homes or even a little business and there's some beautiful grass there and you see how, how well it's taken care of, the plants are really nice and so forth, and you just happen to walk by. Uh, I think the natural response from you is not to step on it. I, I really do. I think that you'll say, wow, that's a beautiful piece of grass. I don't want to step on it. It's like going into someone's home, right? You don't start touching things. You don't, oh, well, what's this, you know? What's all that, you know? What, what is this? You don't do that, right? Because of a natural respect for people's stuff, you know? When you come in, you wipe your feet. And th- now, as soon as someone goes to that yard and puts a sign, do not step on my grass, what is the first thing that goes into my mind? Why not? And then you go to step on it. That's the law. And it shows us that we can't keep it. And so there's principles there, naturally, that come in us when we become Christians that take place in our lives that we know we don't step on people's grass. We, don't know, we know we don't throw rocks at their windows. You know, we just know that. That's a certain respect that comes with being a Christian. So what's the purpose of the law then? Why did God create that law? Well, we know that He created it so we understand God and our relationship with Him and also with, with people and how we ought to respond to people. But more than that, there's a spiritual aspect to it. Galatians, you can turn back in Matthew. But Galatians chapter 3 Verse 24, uh, I would write that down and I would actually read the whole book of Galatians. It's a great book on the law. Paul is very clear concerning the law and gives us some great understanding to the law. <clears throat> but Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law became a teacher. We know what a teacher is. You go to school, they teach you they teach you something they give you instruction they give you knowledge so that you can live a better life a a, a healthier life a wealthier life with all of this education a tutor comes in and that tutor is to take what the teacher has been teaching you and really build upon that for that temporary time a tutor then takes that information and, and tries to get you to understand that knowledge and truth paul here is saying that the law was a tutor It was instructing us like a teacher. It was showing us something about God's commandment. What was it showing us? It says in verse 25, But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. The tutor was showing that we could not keep the law. And that we had to have faith in Christ in order to be justified. Now we know what justified means, right? Being right before God, a right standing, where, where our sins are covered, atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and so we have access to heaven. We cannot have it through the law. You can't get salvation through the law. It only comes through Jesus Christ's death on the cross and His resurrection. And so we have a right standing by faith, and we have to believe that by faith, by the way. 
We have to believe it in our heads. This is what God's word says. And we have to believe it in our hearts that I am saved by faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done internal, eternally. Okay? So you have to believe that. And thus we are no longer under that tutor, that law, that aspect of it bringing salvation, bringing a right standing before God. The law doesn't do that. It only shows us that we are breaking God's commandments. So you need to really remember Galatians chapter 3 here. Very important scripture. Let me give you an example, a plumb line. Uh, A plumb line can only prove that a crooked wall is crooked. You all know what a plumb line is? It's this little weight that looks a little like a cone, point at the bottom. You tie a string on it and you, you, you... pin it up to the top of the building and, and because of gravity just the, the law of gravity it will literally draw you a straight line to the floor and you know that line is perfectly level or straight hor- horizontally or vertically vertically there that's how you tell if walls are crooked or not you just don't go build a wall and then all of a sudden you, why is that wall crooked <laughs> you didn't use a plumb line so a plumb line will only tell you a wall is crooked no matter how you use a plumb line uh, can't make a crooked wall straight because of the plumb line. The law of God is like a plumb line designed to show all people that they are crooked or sinful. It was never intended to make us straight or righteous and indeed it never could. So the law could never, never make us right before God. Just because you follow this law doesn't mean that you're right before God because what happens? We, we, we find out that we can't, right? Because we do step on people's grass. We do not love God the way we're supposed to. We do not keep the Sabbath day holy before the Lord. We do not always honor our fathers and mothers, right? We don't. We fail in those areas. Every commandment we failed in. We've lusted for our neighbor's wives. We've lusted for our neighbor's goods. You know, we have stolen. Doesn't matter how big the item was, you stole. That's stealing. You're a thief. If you tell a little lie, a white lie, you're still a liar. So we know that. So the law doesn't make us perfect. It can't straighten us up. It only condemns us. So that's why we view it as a principle today. We're under that law that has been fulfilled by Jesus. So salvation is all of grace. People do not merit salvation by their own good works at all. Let me give you another example. You take a glass of water and it has dirt in it. And you stir it up, right? You just shake it around. You can see that it's dirty. You leave it there for a while and the, wa- the, the water and the dirt begins to settle in the water and you see there's a little bit of, of clarity at the top of the, the glass, right? And you think, well, I can drink that. No, you can't. There's, there's still a lot of contaminants in that, right? Now you take a spoon that's clean and sterile and you put it into the water and you shake it up. What does the spoon do? It's revealing what was really in the water. Even though the spoon is clean and sterile, it's revealing what's in the water, that there's still garbage in there. That's the law. It only reveals what's really in us. And so when God says keep holy the Sabbath day, he's revealing to us that we don't keep it holy. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean just going to church on every Sabbath day. I'm talking about the attitude of why you go. You're, not, you're here to worship the Lord. And if you're not here to worship the Lord, your mind's somewhere else, you're doing other things, that isn't worshiping the Lord. That's not setting aside the day for God. It's setting aside your heart to the Lord. We get so busy. We are like those Marthas just running around, but we're never sitting and really giving our hearts to the Lord. And we really need to do that. Look at verse 17 now. So we have an understanding of the law. So Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to destroy it or to dissolve it in the Greek or undo it. The law or the prophets, I did not come to destroy but to fulfill uh, does not mean it does not mean the same as to keep. Jesus didn't say, "I come to keep it." We know He kept it. He was perfect in every manner. He had no sin at all. Only man that kept the law of God. But that's not what He's saying here. It's a different word, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, the law and the prophets are referring gen- uh, basically or generally to the whole Old Testament. So he's not just talking about the law, but he's talking about what the prophets also spoke as instruction from God. That we are not under that law, I'm sorry, not that we're not under that law, but that he came to, this, to fulfill that law that they spoke of also. 
So Jesus' mission was not to come and abolish the law at all. The verb destroy or abolish here is a strong one and it indicates doing away entirely with the law and that's not what he's talking about. Because in its context, it's clear that he is in no way contradicting the Messianic law, nor came to dissolve it, but that he is opposed to this legalistic type of religion that the scribes were building upon it. That's what he's opposed to. So I hear people say, I'm not under the law. Don't put me under your law. I say to you, you are under the fulfilled law of Jesus Christ. He didn't abolish the law. It is still in place today. And we follow it from our hearts. And so when God says don't steal, we go, it's not right to steal. It's not a matter of God saying it. It's a matter that it's written in our hearts already that that's the wrong thing to do. Why would I take something from someone else? Someone else that works so hard for. Someone else that may have displaced it uh, on the lawn you know, for a, a moment. And so we come by and we think we have a right to it, you know? like a friend of mine used to do and come come to church all the time with different things and I, where'd you get that it was just laying right there next to someone's house so i took it praise god he blessed me today I'm like no that's stealing that's, that was someone's you know tool that was someone's bike you know and the kid left it out in the on the front of the yard it doesn't mean it's available for you to just take that's wrong it's in the heart itself understand that uh, again when he says prophets here uh, any writings of the prophet. And, and he's making it very clear that he has not come to abolish any part of the Bible at all in the Old Testament. And you'll notice that Jesus quotes quite often in the Gospels from the Old Testament and even from the instructions of Isaiah and Genesis and Exodus and so forth. And he instructs us how we ought to fulfill that law from our hearts. He says, I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. Now, interesting word, fulfill. It has a sense of doing or carrying out. Okay, you carry out something. You, you, you conclude it. You make it complete. And that's what Jesus was saying. You take a sailboat, for instance. You know, you, you make a boat that's to hold you in water so that you can sail to different places. You create this mass and this sail that is to be used to direct you to those places. Now, the sail itself is designed to trap what? Wind. And as soon as the wind comes and you, the, it hits the sail, the sail opens up and it is fulfilled. It is literally fulfilled. It is doing what it's supposed to do. And then it takes you to your destination because it's done what its job was. And that is to trap the wind completely, blow out, and take you forward. So Jesus, in other words, performed what the law was supposed to do in his life. Well, what was that that he did? What was that that he did? We'll get to that in a second. This phrase can also uh, be understood to mean that Jesus terminated or ended the law, bringing it to completion. Some have suggested that to fulfill has been understood in three ways. One, it means that we should do the things laid down in Scripture. Okay? So he came to fulfill it, so we need to do those things in the Scriptures. Two, it may mean that we would bring out the full meaning of Scripture. And then three, it may mean that in this life and teaching, he would bring Scripture to its completion. And I think the, the latter is more true than, than the other two. In other words, Jesus and his work fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it perfectly. He was able to keep it perfectly, and then he fulfilled the end of the law. What's the end of the law? Judgment, right? You break the law and judgment comes. And if you break that law, judgment is demanded. And Jesus did not break the law, but he took the judgment of us. We were found guilty, and he took our place, and he died in our place. So the work, his work on the cross, fulfilled the law. So there's no need for a sacrifice anymore. We don't, we don't have a need for a sacrifice. He was our sacrifice. See, see, there's a part of the law that we don't have to keep. We don't have to offer up a lamb. We don't offer up an offering because he was the ultimate offering in completing the law. Jesus came as a sin offering for the world as the Lamb of God. Jesus became our sacrifice of burnt offering and consecration offering. Jesus became our peace offering, making peace between us and men. It was Jesus. The law couldn't do that again. The law could not do that. Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath law, which was 
the rest that God had given to his people on that day. Christ's death on the cross fulfilled the righteousness of the law. The law required death for obedience. Jesus came to fulfill the law by dying for our disobedience. Romans says this in 10.4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now again, not the end in that it's done away with, but it is fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Also remember that Jesus gave us a new commandment. The law may be summed up in, in these two commandments. You remember them probably very clearly. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And that's pertaining to Jesus, right? And so when you love God that way, and he's giving you a commandment. This is instruction. So it's like one of the Ten Commandments. And he's telling you, you need to love God. And if you love God, if you love God, go to the Old Testament, those three commandments that pertain to God, keeping what? His name holy, keeping the Sabbath day, you know, not creating idols you won't do that if you love God because you love God if you love God you will keep holy the Sabbath day if you love God you will not have graven images you will not worship other things before God those go hand in hand you know that if you're not keeping holy the Sabbath day and you're doing something else that you're looking more forward to that's idols that's worshiping idols also that pertains to God Jesus sums it up those three in one, and then he says, What? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So there he sums up the rest of the ten in another commandment. Just love your neighbor like you love yourself. And so, boy, if you don't want anyone to steal your rake, you know, then don't steal someone else's rake. If you don't want someone to steal your wife or your husband, then don't go looking to steal someone else's wife or husband. Because we love our neighbors like ourselves romans thirteen ten says love does not does not love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law uh-huh there's the fulfillment of the law love we are to love god by honoring him and respecting him not misusing his name keeping holy the sabbath day not creating idols we are to love our neighbors and thus we fulfill the law. Not hurting, not backbiting, not gossiping, not complaining, but loving one another, thus fulfilling the law. That's the heart of God right there. That's the heart of God. And I think when Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount is, is sharing this with us, it is profound. It is life-changing when we realize we're not under the law, but we have fulfilled the law with our hearts. Because our hearts desire to love God. Our hearts desire to love our husbands and our wives and be right with uh, God and with our brothers and sisters. Jesus came to reveal the heart of God's holiness. How? By fulfilling the requirements of the law, not by destroying it. So then he goes on and says in verse 18, For assuredly I say to you, now the emphasis is on the words that follow here, but boy, he says it twice, Assuredly I say to you, boy, I mean, if my dad was to speak to us and he said, look, you better listen to me. That's when you pay attention. Right? And Jesus is saying, hey, surely, truly, amen, I'm about to say something to you. Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. What does he mean by that? That no, no, no part of the scriptures will pass away. No law. No instruction, no command at all. It's all been fulfilled. And these are principles that we are to keep. A jot and a till is just the tiniest mark on the scriptures. A tiniest little point on the scriptures, the smallest of them all. In no way did he say he will destroy it at all. And Jesus was being emphatic here. He was being emphatic. He was in a sense saying, look, it will not pass away. Don't think that I've done away with the law. You are still to keep the law, but keep it with your heart. That's what he was saying in the Greek as he says it here. And then he goes on in verse 19. Whoever therefore, now of course when you hear therefore, what he's saying is listen to what I just said about the law and not destroying it but fulfilling it and how it won't disappear, that, that heaven and earth will burn away before the law will ever go. Therefore, in light of that, this is what he says, break one of the least of these commandments and teach to men 
so he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we have a responsibility with the law. That we are to keep them and show others to keep them too. And if you are telling others they don't have to keep them, and if you're showing others not to keep them by your lifestyle, you're least in the kingdom of God. But if you keep them and teach others to keep them, then you're great in the kingdom of God. Notice that they don't lose their salvation. You don't lose your salvation. He's not talking about salvation there. He's just talking about our walk with the Lord. And if we have this misconception of the law, like the religious leaders did, and if we're teaching men these things, then you're an heir. You're the least in the kingdom of God. You're not up there. And I would hope that all of us would desire to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, that we would strive to win the race and not just glide into the finish line, but win and do something for the Lord. Get excited about what God is doing. You know, Moses going to Nepal, that's a big deal. He's not a perfect man. He's far from that. But he's taking a step of faith and saying, I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm just going to trust in God. That's what God wants from us. He wants to say, look, uh, my life could be messed up. Uh, I, I'm not perfect, but you know what? I'm going to continue to go forward with the Lord. And I, I really like his way than others who sit back and just complain and do nothing with the Lord. It's a lot better way. At least he's doing something than just sitting there. Look, you have a responsibility concerning the law. Don't teach men by your actions. And please, don't teach your children by all means by your actions. It's sad. We've lost some men here in the church, and it's sad. And what's even sadder is that these men are not great examples to their children. That's sad, because their children should look up to them. Their children should want and desire to be like their dad. That's how God has designed us. Our sons should desire to be like you. They should see you and they should see a man of honor and respect. They should desire to be like you, a godly man, a man that has principles, morals and values and sticks by his word. They should desire that. Your daughters should want to be just like their moms. They should be loving and caring and kind and compassionate. They should desire those things. And it's a shameful thing when you aren't those things to your children. And now they're looking for other role models besides you. And not only that, you're causing them to stumble. You're the least in the kingdom of God, Jesus says. You're not the greatest. No, live it. Believe it. Get others to live it and believe it also. Then he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Boy, that must have blew the disciples away. What? (laughs) Because they saw the religious leaders as, wow, they keep the law. They're the interpreters of the law. They're perfect in every way. And Jesus comes along and says, unless your righteousness, disciples, exceeds that of theirs, You'll never enter the kingdom of God. That definitely was like a big blow. The scribes were the ones that took the the letter of the law and then they would interpret it. They would write it down and they would instruct people what to do. They were the least in the kingdom because they were instructing them the wrong way. See what Jesus is doing here? He's telling them they're wrong. The religious leaders are wrong. And he's telling his disciples, you can become more righteous than them. How, How can we become more righteous than them? By the fulfilled law through Jesus Christ, because he came to fulfill the law. So it was his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, his righteousness, because he fulfilled the law in every definition of the word. And so we take on or we receive his imputed righteousness. So I am righteous before God because of Jesus Christ. And I stand before you as a righteous man by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is his righteousness in me by faith, not my own. And the same with yours. So the disciples needed to understand and it would be life-changing when they realized that they were more righteous than the religious leaders because they loved Jesus Christ. And really, that's what Jesus was saying to them. If you love me, 
I will love you. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. If you have a relationship with me, I will have a relationship with you. And my Father in heaven will also have a relationship with you. And that makes a right standing in your life because it is based upon the principles of the law. So you won't break my commandments because you love me. You will be faithful and committed because you love me. You have a relationship with me. When we create a relationship with one another, you meet somebody and you get to, get to know one another. You're looking for certain qualities about one another. You're looking that he's a man of his word. You're looking that he's honest, he's sincere, he's not running around. That's the world, right? I, I busted my boyfriend, he's out with other girls and things like that. Well, that's not the guy you want to hang around with then. That's the guy you want to get rid of. And that's what you're looking for in those qualities. Someone that li- really loves you. Well, the same is true in Christianity. We can say till our face is blue, I love the Lord. But if you're not living for Him, it means nothing to the Lord because He sees your heart. He sees your heart completely. Let me close. According to Christ, certain principles need to be followed when interpreting the law. It's the spirit of the law that is what's most important. The heart behind the law itself. I don't honor my father and mother because they are perfect people. I honor them because they gave birth to me. They fed me. They changed my dirty little diapers. They tickled me. They laughed with me. They hugged me. They loved me. And when my boo-boo hurt, they would fix that boo-boo. And they would spend time in the hospital. They would spend time when they were sick. They would spend their lives with them. They would give to them. They would love them. They give their lives for them. And then they mess up and they don't deserve honor. No. They give their lives for their children. They love their children. And they demand respect and honor from you. Because there's no heart like a father and a mother. No heart that's greater than their love for their children. And until you have children, you won't understand that. And I'm talking at my age, I understand the babies, I understand the toddlers, I understand the teenage years, I understand the adult years. And they're all different. And those of you that are in your children years, you don't understand the teenage years until you get there and your children start becoming rebellious. You don't understand what's going on there and yet you still love them as a parent. You still love them through all of that. No, you honor them because the spirit behind it, the love of the heart. Jesus said the thoughts and actions that lead to obedience of the law are what will be judged. See, God won't judge you on whether you kept it or not. He's going to judge you on the intent of you keeping it. That's a game that we as Christians have to stop playing. Well, I did it. Well, okay, you did it, but where was the heart (laughs) when you did it? Well, I didn't want to do it. (laughs) Well, then that's what God's going to judge you on. That's why we have to change the heart. Allow Him to take our heart of flesh and stone and break it. And how do we do that? By doing it with a good heart. By practicing with a good heart. Now that I'm feeling better, I'm able to do stuff around here again. And it's, it's really exciting for me, especially being hurt and not able to. And I was here clean, washing the windows on the outside the other day. And it was such a joy. I was just singing to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I could wash your windows. And I did the best that I could. You might find a couple of fly pieces here and there. But I did it the best I could. That is such a joy to do it that way. Instead of it being a burden. And I know it's a burden to some people. Because you ask, well, could you get the windows? Yeah, I'll go. Yeah, I'll get the windows. And you know it's a burden, right? God wants that heart changed. Because that's the part that will be judged. The true intent of the law is to bring us into a positive relationship with God and our fellow man. So you are under the law. You are under the fulfilled law of Jesus Christ. The principles to live by. The principles that will bless your life. The principles that will bring prosperity and health to you on a daily basis if you heed those principles.